going to shuffle in electronically. So we're actually going to play a one and a half minute video that does give some background and explanation of our program today. So that, uh, yep. Going to shuffle in electronically. So we're actually going to play a one and a half minute video that does give some background and explanation of our program today. So that, uh, yep. Going to shuffle in electronically. So we're actually going to play a... At the core of modern history lies this remarkable pattern. Over the past five or six centuries, Anglo-American society has entered a new era, a new turning every two decades or so. The first turning is a high, an upbeat era of strengthening institutions and weakening individualism. The second turning is an awakening, a passionate era of spiritual upheaval. The third turning is an unraveling, a downcast era of strengthening individualism and weakening institutions. The fourth turning is a crisis, a decisive era of secular upheaval. America entered its most recent fourth turning in 2008, placing us 15 years into the crisis era. What can we expect during the remainder of this era? And what will follow it? Like nature's winter, a fourth turning can be long and arduous. It can be brief but stormy. The icy gales can be unremitting. But also like nature's winter, it cannot be averted. It must come, just as this winter has. Okay, welcome to Encore Learning Presents. My name is David Tate, and I'm a member of the Encore Learning Special Events Committee, which uh, in conjunction with the Arlington Library System, works hard to bring you these videos. If anyone's interested in helping us out, we'd love to have some additional help. And you, if you're a member of Encore Learning, uh, send a email of interest to info at EncoreLearning.net. Uh, and if you're not a member, please consider becoming a member of Encore Learning. This is an opportune time. There are classes coming up in the fall, and you'll be joining just in time to sign up for those. There's lots of benefits of membership. So you can go to EncoreLearning.net to find out about that. So today we have New York Times bestseller author Neil Howe discussing his latest book entitled the fourth turning is here. And this is gonna be more of a conversation than a formal presentation. And you can actually join in on that conversation by submitting questions. And I wanna make sure that everyone has an opportunity to do that by knowing how to use the technology. Now, we don't use chat for that purpose. Chat is actually disabled. What we do is use Q&A function. And in order to submit a question, you find your Q&A icon on your screen, you type it in, and then click Submit. And I will do my best to insert it into the conversation at the appropriate time. Also, we have available live transcripts. And this is something that you can evoke using the uh, um, options on your screen. There should, again, be an icon about live transcripts. So you use that to either turn it on or off. It's something that's under your control, whichever way you want it. And then also, if you have any kind of technical problems, send an email to info at encorelearning.net and they will help you troubleshoot. And finally, when you, at the end of the webinar, there'll be an opportunity for you to fill out a very short survey and we encourage you to do that. So just one more thing before we get started. I do wanna make sure that everyone's aware of the upcoming events. So on August 21st, we have a conversation with author and DC historian, Brianna Thomas, and she'll be talking about the historic Washington DC U Street neighborhood, so-called Black Broadway in Washington, and it will include a virtual tour of U Street landmarks. And then on September 18th, beginning at 2.30, note the time, half an hour earlier, 
we'll have with us for the fifth time, MSNBC legal expert, Chuck Rosenberg. And again, as for any of you that have joined us when he's been on before, he likes to pretty much jump in with question Q&A right away. So that program will really be about whatever you're interested in. And I think there's plenty of legal, legal things out there to kind of chew on. So you definitely want to put those on your calendar. So with that, uh, we're going to get, I'm going to stop my share and we will started with our, our program. And we have with us actually another uh, special guest to do the introduction and to facilitate the discussion. Libby Garvey is currently the vice chairman of the Arlington County Board. She's actually been a board member since 2012. Before that, for 15 years, she was on the Arlington School Board. So I think it's safe to say that she has been instrumental in making Arlington the award-winning community that we know today. So uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Libby Garvey to do the introductions and kick off our program. Go ahead, Libby. Thank you, thank you so much, David. You can hear me okay, I hope. Yep, very good. That's just great. So thank you to you, thank you to Encore Learning and the Arlington Public Library for putting this together. I am just delighted to have Neil Howe here with us today to talk about his newest book, The Fourth Turning Is Here. He has written many books, co-authoring seven with William Strauss, including the book Generations written in 1991. And that's where they coined the term millennials that we still use today. People here um, today may remember Bill Strauss, who besides writing with Neil and working on Capitol Hill, founded the Capitol Steps. And I understand from Neil, he got pulled onto stage once with Bill and their introduction was that one of them is historical and the other is hysterical. <laughs> anyway, um, it's been a long, it was a long partnership. Uh, sadly, uh, Bill passed away just about as we started entering this fourth turning. Um, I was given their book, The Fourth Turning, uh, in 2020, uh, when I was chairing the county board. Um, that book was published in 1997, but predicted a major crisis, probably financial, they said, around 2005, and said there'd be multiple crises around 2020 which could include a pandemic, a war, climate disaster. And they said we would see a rise in authoritarianism. And I thought to myself, clearly these guys know something. Um, most helpfully for me was that the book presented um, you know, what they knew, which was a pattern and some logic to explain the chaos of that year and actually the chaotic sort of turbulent times we're living in right now. And I think understanding what's happening and what's likely to happen next is so helpful when you are living in turbulent times and trying to manage crises um, as we all are either in our, our work lives or in our personal lives. And I'm sure I'm not the only one here today who when people ask me, how are you? I pretty much now respond, oh, I'm fine, but the world is falling apart which everybody kind of nods their head and chuckles because that's kind of where everybody is right now. Um, I have been recommending the fourth turning to people ever since 2020 and wanting to have Neil come to Arlington to talk about his work since then as well. And here he is, Neil. Thank you so much for joining us today. It is exciting to have you with us so soon after the publication of your newest book, The Fourth Turning is Here. And I'd love to just jump right in because there's a lot to talk about. Why don't you start off by just sort of telling us how this book came to be? Wow. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you, Libby. And it, it's a pleasure to be here. I've, uh, I've lived here uh, uh, for many, many years, actually, over 30 years uh, in Fairfax County. Uh, and uh, uh, just delighted, you know, to be, to be doing something local, you know. Uh, this book has a long history. Uh, uh, Bill and I, Bill Strauss and I, actually started uh, writing together in the late 1980s. So this book goes back a long ways. And I would say the, the, the foundation for the whole method that we present, which is looking at history generationally as a, as a sequence of, of collective generational biographies, uh, dates to our first book. Uh, in the book Generations, we actually uh, did something that we discovered to our surprise, no one had ever done before. And that is to retell all of American history as a sequence of generational biographies, right? No, normally in history, you write about what everyone was doing in one year. So here's what everyone was doing in 1851. Here's what everyone was doing in 1852. And typically you write mostly about people in their late fifties or sixties, you know, leaders, people of leadership age. Um, uh, and occasionally you'll, you know, you'll have a history of youth or history of old age you'll be following another group, you know, another age group every year. 
But we said, what about writing history on the generational diagonal, starting with one group uh, and following them from youth to coming of age to their entire life, and then doing the next group, right? And you can see that if you plot, if you think about history as, uh, you know, on the, on the x-axis is uh, time, and on the y-axis is age. We all live a diagonal line, right? And a generation is a group of diagonal lines. And one point in time is a vertical line through all those diagonals. And imagine how different that event means to these different diagonals. They have different memories. They were shaped different ways, right? Um, and always in history, we have to remember that this has been true. Now, one of the first uh, writers on the the, the the theory of social generations it was a very popular in the 1920s in particular to think about social generations is when Karl Mannheim was writing. And there was one person who actually invented the term social generation, uh, la, uh, la génération sociale. This was uh, Jean Montré, and he was a French writer, and he wrote this book called Social Generations. And he likened generations to tiles on a roof, right? So there's diagonal lines, just like tiles on a roof. And he said, why don't we tell history that way? So Bill and I decided to do that. And one of the things we noticed was not only did uh, generations have a self-identity back in the 17th and 18th century, but they also, different generations came in patterns. Certain generations always followed other generations. Uh, a, lot of, um, a lot of us are today aware that boomers, this generation of uh, but idealistic utopians, you know, they had a very comfortable childhood. They came of age raging against the uh, inst powerful institutions built by their parents. Um, and they made these, uh, all these demands on the system to give way to their, to their visions and uh, their priorities. And they were followed by this generation that was much more, um, shall we say, pragmatic, survivalist, uh, some would say cynical, very matter of fact, you know, interested in just, you know, figuring out winning or losing and just sort of making sense of the world in a much more practical way that we've seen that before constantly in American history. I mean, following the generation of, of Abraham Lincoln and uh, 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 William Lloyd Garrison or, or Ralph Waldo Emerson and, 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 and uh, uh, Walt Whitman, you know, a, a generation obsessed with themselves and their ideals, a generation of feminists, commune founders, and so on, that they were followed by the George Armstrong Custers and the Ulysses Grants. I mean, generations of metal and muscle who didn't talk very much, but they got big, dirty jobs done, right? Often at great sacrifice. We've seen this pattern again and again, and, and following those more pragmatic generations, we often see a moral panic of our children. And suddenly the desire to raise a more protective group of children. I mean, we saw that after the Gilded Generation. We saw that also after the Lost Generation, when today's, you know, we often call them today's senior citizens or little kids, you know, back in the presidencies of, of, of Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. One aspect of the whole progressive movement was the protection of children, child labor laws. Uh, getting playgrounds off the streets, giving allowances to kids for good behavior, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Campfire Girls, 4-H Club. This was all of what today's senior citizens, uh, we later, you know, these were the greatest generation, the generation that later fought World War II. This is how they were raised as protective kids. And of course, we're very familiar with the fact that millennials today uh, grew up in the 1980s and 1990s as a much more protective group of children. Anyway, to see these patterns recur over time, this is what Bill and I were originally interested in, recurring generational patterns. And, and only later did we think this actually implied uh, a certain regularity, certain patterns in history itself. Because after all, generations shaped by history then grow up as leaders, you know, as, as parents and, and midlife leaders to shape history, maybe 40 years later, right? So that implies a pattern in history itself. Now, in the book we did a little bit later, uh, the fourth turning, it came out in um, 1997. We put the pattern of history first and we explained it through generational change. And this pattern refers to something that historians have often noticed, that if you look at periods of enormous 
civic upheaval in our history, periods where we reconstructed the outer world of national community, the economy, politics, infrastructure, um, how we live in our sort of extended social existence. Um, we, we go through these periods about once every long human life. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, or as I think was, was previewed at the beginning, um, one that many, many historians are familiar with is the period in the final decade of the 17th century. We went through the, the in the colonies, this is the period of, of radicalism and rebellion and revolution in the colonies, the period of the glorious revolution and King Philip's War and Bacon's Rebellion. I mean, all historians regard this as the revolutionary uh, uh, end of the, of the 1600s. And then uh, about a, a human lifetime later, we went through the American Revolution, right? And then uh, another, another human lifetime was the Civil War. And then came the Great Depression and World War II. And then lo and behold, here we are today, right? Um, and then halfway in between these two periods of outer world community crisis, come these periods of inner world, right, remaking. These are the periods when we reconstruct the internal world of values, religion, uh, culture, the arts. Um, and very conveniently, historians have actually numbered these. They call them the Great Awakenings. You know, the first Great Awakening, the second Great Awakening, the third Great Awakening. And many historians call the late 60s and 70s America's third or fourth or even fifth Great Awakening depending on when you want to start your count, right? With, with, with John Winthrop in the 17th century or Jonathan Edwards in the 18th century. So this is the basic architecture. Some generations come of age with an awakening, like boomers. Some generations are children during an awakening, like Xers. Uh, and then some generations come along after the awakening and come of age with a crisis. And this would be like the GI generation or the Republican generation that founded America and, and so on, right? So we, we actually call these archetypes, but it gives you a general idea of what we talk about. Um, the, the, the whole idea is, is that history goes through these social moves defined by the entry of each new generation into a new phase of life and particularly a new generation coming of age into adulthood. And, and these uh, give life to the spring, the summer, the fall, and the winter um, of, of this cycle. And, 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 and that many of the same themes recur and many of the same types of generations occupy similar phases of life when we're entering them. You know, I'm struck by, because um, you talk about how they're, they, they just repeats and repeats, but this maybe is the first time that we've going into one of these periods where we're aware of the pattern. I mean, I know that you, you talk a lot about classical societies and they had some awareness, but it feels like, you know, with your book, and I'm sure a lot of people are reading and thinking, we're, we're more aware of things than as a species um, than maybe we have been before. And I don't know if that's going to make any difference at all. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure it does, because it's one thing to be aware of it intellectually, but it's another thing to have ourselves rewired socially through actually undergoing the experience, right? Um, I think it's one thing to know that things have to change, but it's another to write. I mean, think about it. Um, you think about America in the late 1930s, right? Uh, it was still mired in the Great, you know, the Great Depression. Uh, I never thought that it would get out. Even even in 1940, we were still had deflation. Bond yields hit their all time lows. I mean, it, we we still hadn't gotten out of anything. People were wondering what it would take. Uh, I think they probably would have told you it would take something enormous ever to bring community again back to America. And lo and behold, they got something enormous. <laughs> it's called the World War II, you know, which, which ultimately completed the process of bringing back this new sense of community, national community to America. But I'm not sure, even if they had realized intellectually 
that that's what they needed, that they didn't have to go through the process, uh, the experience itself. It, it, this is part of actually a very interesting uh, discussion. Um, Libby and I, I actually discuss it, I think it's in chapter eight, I actually talk about William James, who delivered a famous uh, uh, address at Stanford University, uh, I believe in 1906, uh, where he talked about, uh, it's, a, it's famous, and I think most people have heard it. It was called The Moral Equivalent of War, right? right. Uh, and he, he was a pacifist, uh, unlike uh, his, uh, uh, his contemporary, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was uh, you know, famously uh, two or three times wounded during the Civil War. But the two of them are great counterpoints, and I discussed their different views of the Civil War. But um, uh, William James gave this address, and he, he, he hypothesized. He started out by saying, isn't it amazing how everything that is good about being a nation, a community, you know, the willingness to sacrifice you show for a citizen, to, deliver, to give up your private life for the commonweal, you know, to undergo sacrifices in a group. Uh, to be able to cooperate with others. And you say all these things, he says, when you look back historically, and again, here's a, he's a pacifist talking about this. And he says, it, it's really unimaginable without war, how we would actually be forged into these kinds of communities. And he goes through that and he makes a quite convincing case. And then he says, could it be possible that there'd be some other process other than war? And he hopes it is. I, I think, frankly, if you actually go and read the lecture, you, you may not be sure he himself is convinced that it's possible. But in the process, he asked one fascinating question. He, he asked his audience, and remember, this is 1906. He asked his audience, could you, uh, if, I, if, I, if I asked you, and he was addressing everyone there, he said, if I asked you, would you prefer that this country had never gone through the Civil War? He, he, he answered his own question. He says, I'm sure almost none of you would say yes, which is kind of shocking to us listening today. He said, you, none of us would want an America that didn't have the sense of progress, unity. And he would go down all the things we achieved after the Civil War. He said, we couldn't imagine. Now, the Civil War was a catastrophic event in terms of loss of human life. We all know that, right? But here he was in imagining that no one in his audience would want us to go through that. But then he says, this isn't it paradoxical? He said, if I asked all of you in the audience, do you wish we'd go through another such event in the next few years? He said, I'm sure almost all of you would say no. <laughs> so, and, yeah, this, and this brings I, me to why like, I stay up at, I told you, I was lost sleep last night a little bit, thinking about the thing is, with the other thing that's a first hmm. now, really, I think is that we're able to destroy ourselves with war and destroy the planet with war. I know we were kind of there in World War II, but we're coming out of it, right? Um, and that sort of, so this is a great, I, I, you can even, you know, say I'm a Quaker, so I, I can't say I like war, right? But you can sort of see the winter has to come to get to the spring. But what if you never get out of the winter because you've destroyed so much spring can't make it? I mean, that's, that's when right. I, you know, and then we'll get more positive later. We might as well go negative right now. But that's, I think that's the most distressing thing about the, the theory, which looks so accurate. Well, Yes, things can always go terribly wrong. And I talk about that. Uh, it's yeah. a time of great danger, a time of great risk. Uh, we all know, look, uh, and I point this out early in the book. I just point out very honestly, I said, uh, every total war that we've had, not just in America, but sort of Anglo-America, I mean, going back to the end of the Middle Ages, I said, every total war has always occurred in a fourth turning, and a fourth turning has always had a total war, right? I mean, think about that. That's a pretty close correspondence. And I said, uh, Organized conflict seems to be part of the puzzle because what it does is it creates, it's out of that that creates this new sense of community. And it's exactly what William James is referring to in his speech. And he said there's a paradox here. He says that, um, yeah, we, we, we're glad we had one in the past. We don't want one in the future. And, and what I think would be, it's very closely related to how we think of our personal lives. And I haven't asked people, You've been through a terrible period in your life. Maybe you lost a loved one. You went through a divorce. You, your business went uh, uh, bankrupt. I mean, horrible things happened to you. But you ask most people, would you rather you had never gone through that? And interestingly, most people will say, no, I really became a deeper, wiser person through that experience, right? I mean, we do. It, it's sort of, 
Well, it's, it's, if it doesn't, color. if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. That's the well, it right. Makes you stronger, but it. But sometimes it, makes, it kills you. It makes you deeper. Well, yeah, because right. we only ask the survivors. <laughs> Maybe that's it, right? We only ask the survivors. But it's interesting. But again, it's the same thing. If you ask most people, oh, that's interesting. Would you like another such event next year? Of course, people will say, well, of course not. You know, I'm wise enough. Thank you right now, right? So, so in other words, it's very analogous, and I do think that. Um, I, I do think that it's, it's a complex system and we talk about complex systems in, in nature and how well, they often have these periods of recurring stages. And often one of those stages is um, uh, rapid change, right? In other words, rapid and, and uh, kind of catastrophic change to where things suddenly change overnight and it comes out rejuvenated. Um, you know, we all know this is something um, we talk about in, in sort of the environmental community, right? Forests need fires. In fact, a lot of trees need fires for the, for the a lot of the sequoias need fires even for the seeds to germinate. Uh, uh, rivers need floods. Um, uh, and societies need periods too. When, when, they are, uh, when they are reconstructed and made young again, I do think that the end of the fourth turning is a period of rejuvenating institutions and tipping society away from the privileged and the old, you know, the people who have, you know, rewarded for doing things in the past and investing again in the future and uh, giving a lot more equality of opportunity to the next generation to come. We've seen that trend, and that's actually one of the fourth turning trends I described is from privilege to equality. That's a, this huge trend toward equality at the end of every fourth turning is, is one of the things we've seen, along with a willingness to suddenly make long-term policy decisions and reconstitute our institutions on a new platform. I would say fourth turnings are bad. The only thing that's worse than a fourth turning is not having a fourth turning. I mean, imagine all the trends today, right? In terms of equality, in terms of our inability to, in terms of, uh, sclerotic and, and incapacity in our institutional life. Imagine those just getting wor forever worse without change, right? Um, and so this is the historical process. Great reforms, great constitutional changes are never engineered, at least not in our history, on bright sunny days, right? <laughs> when we have surpluses and everything looks great. Ironically, and I point that out again and again in American history, times of huge constitutional change occur when our near-term survival is most in doubt. I mean, think of the fact that we, 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 um, we drafted a new constitution at the end of the 1780s, which as I document, uh, it was probably the most horrible decade in American history. A standard of living decline that probably exceeded that of the 1930s. It was a time of, uh, uh, poverty, violence, uh, and complete doubt as to whether the independent states would break up or be reacquired by Spain and France and England. And out of nowhere, of this period of very dark crisis, we created this new constitution. You think of all the things we pioneered during the Civil War, right? Um, you know, the Transcontinental Railroad, the first state-funded colleges, uh, a national currency, the first income tax, uh, the trans, you know, I could go through all these things, right? And to say nothing of the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments. Well, this was done at a time, Libby, when Washington, D.C. itself was under threat of capture, right? In other words, I, it was literally true when the near term future of this country was most in doubt. Social Security itself, the Social Security Act of 1935, which was planned in 1934, with these optimistic spending projections that went up to the 1980s. Uh, and, 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 and it contained within it everything about our modern welfare system, right? All these state federal programs, the, the, the forerunners of uh, you know, TANF and SSI and, and all of the programs for the handicapped, all of these programs, right? These were legislated at a time when unemployment in America was in the double digits. Our GDP had shrunk catastrophically beneath what it was in 1929. Fascists were taking over governments in Europe. I can't imagine a worse time 
to be planning these things. And yet this is when we did it. Um, this happens again and again. And, and I think there's a reason for that. I, I don't think this is coincidental. Okay. So um, anyway. Are you, ready for, are you ready for a yeah. question? Yeah, I'm always ready for a question. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we have one coming in from Steve Young. Um, probably not the the quarterback, but who knows? So, <laughs> I know Steve. He's not a quarterback. I don't think. Might you're, have been speaking an old, uh, you're speaking to an old Forty Nine er fan here. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, but uh, can you comment on the uh, conductive uh, or long wave cycle? I think also K a K wave concept and how it relates to your thinking and your um, the concepts you've developed. Yes. Well. Uh, Nikolai Kondratiev was a, um, a, uh, a Russian economist uh, who looked at the data and hypothesized a, a long cycle in the economy. And he had about three cycles he had in mind. Now, <clears throat> tragically, I should say, this went, he, he wrote in the, um, in the late 1920s, and this went contrary to um, uh, the, the Leninist regime at the time who believed that everything was linear, everything went in according to uh, uh, a Marxist-Leninism. And so he was sent to the gulag and shot okay, for, for, for his labors. But his theory has become uh, very widespread in the West ever since. And it's given birth to a whole family of long-term economic cycles that are, that are generally called K-wave or, or you know, K-cycles, right? Um, uh, I just, we discussed them in our book, The Fourth Turning. I talk about them a little bit more in detail in the, uh, in this book. And yes, there's a close correspondence there. And I, and I should say, there is a correspondence between the saculum, which is this long, this long wave we're talking about, right? This long four turning wave. And many of the cycles we see that have been looked at by social scientists. Another one is the, uh, is the, is the uh, uh, realignment cycle in, in politics, right? In other words, when do the two parties fundamentally realign in terms of their constituencies and which one is on top? Uh, that, that has happened during, you know, that is a complete correspondence. It's always during an awakening or during a crisis. So that, that completely follows our cycle. Uh, another one is um, cycles of demography. In other words, when do fertility rates go up or down? When does immigration go up or down? Uh, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, cycles of foreign policy. Um, so we actually have a chapter, I believe it's chapter four, when we go through some of these parallel cycles, that is to say, what have others seen in our history which parallels these same shifts in moods? Uh, so I take that very seriously. I'm a demographer, so I, I look at a lot of these kinds of data. And uh, yes, the K wave is a, is a is a very interesting one, and, and one I think that's um, that that has some merit. So let's hope you don't suffer the same fate as uh, Nikolai. You say, <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and Nikolai. Yeah, I think it was Nikolai Kondratiev. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, here's another one uh, I might uh, want to go ahead and take on. So how much do um, you think <clears throat> social media will affect the fourth change? And how do you think AI will change things even more compared to, say, past cycles? You know, AI is an interesting one. Um, you know, my my day job is actually at a at a is 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 is, is, is I, actually I'm with Hedgehog Risk Management. I head up their demography team, and so all of my you know clients are wealth managers and. Um, uh, they they ask me a lot about AI because AI has sort of taken over a lot of financial markets, right? I mean, uh, people are investing according to AI. They're they're using machine learning models and so on to try to allocate their funds and, and to try to trade. Uh, I've seen this trend now for for years. Uh, I think it's come to the attention of the public with these large language models, right? You can actually have new, these, you know, go into Chat GPT four or whatever and, and get these answers, but. I think this has been with us growing for the past 10 years, particularly the last five years, the ability of, these, of, of AI really to do stuff. But I will tell you that in the way I look at history, what is most interesting about technology, and, and um, I, again, I, I give this plenty of space in the book. I said, 
um, technology is is it's it's more fruitful to look at how generations shape technology than that than how gener than how technology shapes generations. I'll give you an example, and and Libby, this is one I think you'll appreciate. Um, it was interesting that when we first invented uh, microchips, you know, silicon wafers and so on. I grew up in California, so that was out, in, you know, where I grew up, uh, and. Uh, it was interesting that the generation coming of age at the time were boomers, you know, people like uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And the paradigm they had in mind for using this technology was the personal computer. Now, what could be more boomer, right, than a personal computer? I mean, everything was just completely reflected this generation's new approach toward individualism, down with institutions. In fact, the first big advertisement was the 1984 won't be like 1984. You remember showing someone yeah. throwing their hammer into the tell screen and their Stalinist dad, you know, was sitting there lecturing. So isn't that interesting? We like to think that the technology came in from nowhere, but isn't it really the generational change? That is to say, back in the late 1960s, our whole way of thinking about organizations, the A-frame pyramid, someone made all the decisions at the top and gave everyone orders, right? Uh, and the idea that we could all make our decisions down at the bottom and give our own life some direction, right? Without needing uh, to be directed by hierarchies was I think boomers taking a hold of that technology and using it for their own purposes. And in fact, that was during the awakening. And I think during the next era, during the unraveling, uh, during the third turning, uh, how many presidents declared that the microchip will topple dictators all over the world? Remember, Reagan said that, and then Clinton said that, and then uh, Bush, uh, G.W. Bush said that. They all said that this, these new, the, the spread of the web and the spread of these little silicon chips, they will topple authoritarians all around the world. And again, I would say that was simply in keeping with the tide of opinion at the time, right? In other words, what was the leitmotif of the 1990s if not Francis Fukuyama, right? The end of history. Mm -hmm. Markets were triumphant. Individualism were triumphant. Governments and authorities were just all fade away. And we would just be transacting with each other, right? As individuals, dissociated individuals around the world. But interestingly enough, as we entered the fourth turning and a new generation, which is more interested in recapturing order and interested more in security and more interested in community has come of age that suddenly all these dictators seem to be happy with this technology. Yeah. They can uh, surveil all their populations. They can galvanize mob rule on social media at their pleasure. So my point is this, is it really true that technology shapes social mood? Or does technology simply serve social mood? I ask that question seriously because yeah, and other technology is a tool. That's what I, it's a tool, and it depends who uses it and how, yeah. right? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, you know, I, I had if and they do, doesn't have any other questions. I, another one. Could you talk? I'm realizing every fourth turning, you've got a great leader. I mean, I think that's the pattern. You a leader comes to the fore. I'm guessing that's why you see a rise of authoritarianism because for a while there's a vacuum. And you've got all kinds of people plunging in. I'm the leader. I'm the leader. I'm the leader. Um, is that true? And then eventually somebody comes out on top. We hope it's a George Washington and not an Adolf Hitler, right? Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. That that sums it up really neatly, doesn't it? Um, now, it's very interesting that throughout history, populism and authoritarianism have always been wed, right? Because the populace, they, they don't have their own organization. They don't have their own, um, you know, they don't have their own experts. So in order to, so th when the people feel oppressed by elites, right? They often, the only way they can find expression of their resentment is by a strong man who comes in and destroys the elites on their behalf. And that has always been true of populism. This is not new. In fact, I remind people that the word populism comes from the Latin popularis, with the supporters of Julius Caesar. And, and against him was, was the, uh, the optimates, the good people, right? These were, the, these were people like, you know, uh, 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 
Cato and Brutus and, you know, all of the people who were, they were good people. They were the educated people. They knew all the rules. They were tradition, they, right? They were the tradition. They were tradition. They were the elites. They thought the system worked just fine. The populares were the ones who championed Caesar. But this is nothing new. This just remains with us today. This is comes up again and again in history. So this is what we're this is what we're dealing with around the world. And we when we talk about the rise of populism and authoritarianism, I don't mean that as some sort of paradox. I mean these two always go together. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm just saying that yeah. that's the fear that we expect. And 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 they're coming together again. It is not. Uh, it's you know not only is it not just in America, it's not even primarily in America. We see this in in Latin America. You know, you look at Argentina, Brazil, Venezuela. You look at uh, AMLO in Mexico. You look at you look at um, you look at much of Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. Look at Russia. Look at India with Narendra Modi. Look at Burma. Look at obviously China, the Philippines. This is around the world, and. What is driving this is a, a disaffection with democracy itself, with due process. Younger generations in particular, and I point out, there's a lot of research on this. It's younger generations that are giving up in democracy because they see democracy as a vetocracy. Older people can talk about anything, but nothing ever changes, right? They always have ways, right? They can always, uh, through, through lawsuits or through vetoes or through various kinds of stasis ensuring mechanisms that nothing changes and the old always get to keep what they have, right? So this also reminds us of the 1930s. And again, this is exactly what we saw in the 1930s and the same sense of partisanship and the division of the world into two camps. Uh, uh, the 1930s was a time in America when if you were on the popular front or you, you, know, you were with the New Deal, you thought it was the, you know, you thought it was the fascist decade, but if you were a Republican, you thought it was the red decade, right? And and you you said that, you know our president is Franklin Stalin or Roosevelt. I mean, you know, this is the kind of mood you were dealing with. It was an enormously polarized decade, and similarly, the whole world was moving toward um, authoritarianism and and populism back then. Uh, world trade was declining as a share of product since 1929, exactly as ours is doing again since 2008. Um, and the world is becoming less free. I mean, you look at VDEM at Freedom House, they show the same thing since 2008, right? A decline in democracy, a decline in freedom worldwide. So th these are general trends and, and the, the mood of younger generations to look for community and even to realize that their, their odds are enhanced by living with their families. I mean, when was the last time we, we've seen so many people in their late 20s and 30s living with their parents? It was in the late 1930s. Uh, and we all recall those, those Jimmy Stewart movies. You remember with Frank, Frank Capra was the producer, Mr. Smith goes to Washington, you can't take it with you. And they always show these big- The wonderful life, houses. right? Yeah. Yeah, well, they always showed the big Victorian houses with many people living together. Why? Well, we were building new houses during the 1930s. So it was a depression, right? And so people were piled up in one family. We're doing it again today. They were just they're McMansions, right? All these big structures built for boomers. And people are living together again. And, and I think, again, to, to be aware of some of these same trends, not necessarily in the outward appearance of everything, but looking again at social moods and looking at generational motivations. Yeah, and people have good reasons for feeling the way they do. Is there a cycle? I just realized, is there a cycle for autocracies? Because, so we fight, I mean, democracy, autocracy, I mean, democracy is sort of a new form of government. So maybe there's not a pattern yet. Do you see, because autocracies also tend to, yeah, overreach and then people decide, wait a minute, this isn't what I meant. Um, well, I, I would say, look, um, every country at a time of crisis, particularly a time of war, becomes pretty authoritarian. Yeah, right. <laughs> Even the United States. I mean, look what we did during World War II. I mean, we rounded up all Japanese Americans, even if they were citizens, and we put them in, you know, we relocated them. We, we, we were, I just think that, I think that's just inevitable, right? Uh, that, that at a time when we are uh, mobilized as a public and truly convinced 
that certain outer world objectives are necessary for the survival of the country, we inevitably become a more regimented society. I just, I think it has nothing to do with our underlying political beliefs. That just has to do with how we get through this next period. Yeah, but what I'm saying is autocrats come up. So like the French Revolution, if you look at revolutions, they 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 come up, they get fostered kind of by the dissatisfied people. You get this revolution. And then eventually, often the revolution eats its own and they the, the revolution tends to unravel, right? That's also a pattern. I'm not... I don't know well, enough. Sat down, and thought about it. No, just, no, no. You're absolutely right. But but these are these are societies too that were in a fourth turning. So you always end up with a more powerful national community at the end of fourth turnings. I mean that always happens, right? So if you really want to know where we end up, I mean think about it in terms of sort of social mood space, right? To go from the end of the third turning to the beginning of the first turning, right? Let's say we're at the end of this, this coming fourth turning, and the first turning maybe in, by the mid 2030s, let's just say, first turning is over. Think about America from the late 1920s. You know, a period of very weak civic authority. Uh, you know, Hemingway called it the age of the movable feast. You know, that it was the, it was the time of the uh, of the endless uh, stock market rise. Uh, it was a very frenetic period of, of of kind of wild individualism, a period of the of the gin frizz crowd and and rum runners and barnstormers and you know well and of, terrible oh, the whole that, that's that's when the, the racism and the whole Jim Crow stuff and the lynching was so bad uh, then right we, we had that as well yeah and then think about what we became by the late thirties and early excuse me by the late forties and early fifties right. So we entered a sort of Ozzy and Harriet land, right? And think about how America changed. Think of the difference, the change in the government's relationship to the economy, uh, uh, America's relationship with the world, uh, uh, humanity's relationship with technology, and just, just everything about how the culture changed in this very conformist and cautious direction, right? Compared to where we were in the 20s, uh, when, you know, when jazz was a big thing in, in the Harlem Renaissance, right? But think where we changed. And I think thinking about where we were around the year 2000 to the time we're going to see coming after this, right? We're going to see, we're going to see a similar change, a more ordered world. I mean, the world was, was because of what the crisis had done to us, uh, the world was more ordered. The first thing we did after America got out of World War II was create all of these global institutions, uh, you know, the, the the UN, the IMF, the World Bank, Bretton Woods. <laughs> we created all these things to make sure that none of those horrible things that happened in the 1930s would happen again, right? We, have, we had power sharing, we had uh, all the global alliances, we had things to make sure that we wouldn't uh, engage in uh, uh, predatory trade policies, uh, we, had, we had Marshall Plan to invest in, you know, struggling economies and so on. We did everything we could to ensure that we would have collective power sharing in a more stable world, a more structured world. And that was a gift that lasted for decades, right? And how many generations have grown up with that, with that kind of stability? Um, and then people get bored with it? Is that part of what happens? And generations way? forget. And generations yeah. forget. And remember that generations grow old they lose with them the memory of what they went through. And this is why this takes a lifetime, Libby. Because by the time in a lifetime, everyone who remembers the event, or certainly was, a, was an adult during the event, is gone. Even the children who remember it are really out of power by then. Um, and I think that's very important. Uh, we wouldn't have had the 60s if the generation in power hadn't remembered hadn't been the generation that came of age in World War II, and they would be damned, you know, if they were going to let these institutions weaken because that was all that stood between themselves and chaos when they were coming of age in the late 30s. And again, that's why I remembered, I started out by talking about the generational diagonal, right? Take one event through all these diagonals and different people remember it differently. And at that time, the late 1960s, the generation in charge the greatest generation that finally were the presidents, they finally were the congressmen in power. 
and they were a powerful generation of builders. They passed the the Civil Rights Act. They 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 gave us, you know, Medicare and Medicaid. They they I mean they built they they gave us the Great Society, right? They were going to try to do FDR one better. Um, and at the height of all their building, and at the height of all their uh, uh, making sure the world is safe for democracy with Vietnam and everything else. Um, Boomers introduced all these new social trends, which basically caused everything to sort of disappear under their feet, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly the, the world is awash in this new kind of individualism, this new cult of self. Uh, crime was rising, divorce was rising, the family was falling apart, right? And so the great disappointment in their life of this generation of builders was, of course, they entered old age, just as the awakening was getting underway, right? And, and they saw so much of this disappear. But you understand how adamant they were about making sure these institutions stayed strong, given what they had come of age with. Right. Boomers have no experience with that. Boomers, boomers have no memory of that. This is why what we call the profit archetype, which comes of age with these awakenings, is always born after the crisis. It always happens in the same way. It's just like a it's just like the transcendental generation was born after the new republic had been established. But still, you know, you can see, so I came of age, women couldn't have their own credit cards, right? I still go in places where I had to wear a skirt to school. I couldn't wear pants, right? Um, couldn't get birth control unless I was married. I mean, there were all of these, you know, so I'm just looking at it from the feminist perspective and for what, so, you know, both generations, I can, I totally understand where they're coming I, from, and, but it and, gets back to the need, need for some change, right? Yeah, and I will say this, that there is no such thing as a, as a perfect turning. Yeah. You know, uh, in other words, all of these turn, all of these seasons give and take, right? They give you some things, take others, right? Um, everyone knows what was horrible about the 50s. I mean, about the 50s, individualism, you know, institutions are strong. Younger people and, might not. That's a question. I'm going to push back real quick. But does every, you say everybody knows about the 50s. I would suspect really younger people don't have a clue where it seems so long ago it wasn't real. Well, well they, it, it, all depends which, it all depends which young people you're asking. I mean, it's interesting. There was a there was a movie made uh, in, in the late 1990s uh, called Pleasantville. Yeah. And it was about a bunch of extra teenagers. And they go back. Pleasantville is this uh, black and white. Ozzy and Harriet uh, world, and they go back, and they're actually transported back into this world. And they, they, this is very much the negative view of the fifties, right? Because these people were so benighted, uh, they had such stereotypical thoughts. They introduced to them all kinds of, you know, new, novel, creative ways of looking at literature and life. And they introduced them to sex, I think, in particular. And anyway, all of this stuff, and suddenly all these people came back to, to in color, you know, from being black and white, they really had color. Um, I think this is the view that we, we had. I, I think actually the 1950s today, as opposed to, you know, in the mid 1990s, look a little bit better in retrospect. Well, yeah, you know, because we, things look pretty bad now. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you think about it, this is a time when the middle class was very strong. Uh, standard of living growth was pretty rapid. Um, people actually believed in big institutions. They trusted big institutions. People actually did what the experts told them to do. I mean, even from a progressive point of view, I think they would, you know, unions were strong, right? I mean, think about these things, right? Um, yeah, I but you didn't have voting right. Yeah. We, we could push, we could argue this one. There were, I mean, there were a lot of people for whom it was not great too, yeah? Well, a lot of people wasn't great, but I'll, I'll tell you that uh, 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 for non-white Americans, very rapid standard of living growth. I mean, in terms of home ownership and income growth, faster than whites. In fact, faster in absolute terms, in fact, like any other period in our history. And at the at near the end of that period, um, the Voting Rights Bill of 1965. Um, would we enact that today? I, I'm just asking hypothetically, right? In other words, and I would say for another thing that gets down on it is sex. You know, how, how you know, the sort of the grainy Ed Sullivan era, we you know, sort of down on sexuality. Just interviewing new people today about sex. I mean, I'm telling you, young people certainly were more positive about it back in the 1950s, and young adults were doing a lot more of it than today. So I sometimes ask, you know, who, 
you know, who's calling who's there a wasteland? You know what I mean? I mean, I, I said that search. That that was that was. Oh yeah, uh, I'm not calling Newton it a wasteland. Minow. I'm just saying, yeah. It's but, just... but that was Newton Minow. He was he was. I'm doing a answer. boomer defense. <laughs> but, but, but I will say this: there were a lot of things not to like about the '50s, and one of them was this huge prevailing emphasis on conformity mm -hmm. and the social ethic and the teaching of people that you had certain social roles. I mean, I, I, in high schools, I mean, if you're a young man, you were taught to be the wage earner. If you're a young woman, you were taught to be a homemaker. And it, it was like a bee colony. <laughs> you know? Everyone had a certain role. But it's interesting how in that time, the whole culture celebrated modesty about personal expectations, even the soft drink ads, you know, uh, be sociable, have a Pepsi. You know, I mean, think about that. Or, uh, or uh, 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 the soft drink ads actually celebrated that kind of um, um, tameness. Whereas today, of course, it's all you know, do the do, and it's in your face, right? So it it shows you something that that is simply different, and and you can see that there's a gain and a loss, right? I think a lot of people today would be profoundly uncomfortable in uh, the 1950s world, I would say, because we've been, become used to all of this individualism. Nonetheless, I think history shows that this new kind of communitarianism, which will be there coming up, will be regarded as a much better world, particularly by the coming of age generation of the time. And that will surprise everyone, right? Much as it did in the 1950s. Um, because people in the 1950s did think that they had achieved something that was vastly better than what they recall of the 20s and, and obviously of the, of the catastrophic depression. Yeah. So I'd like to love to return to a little bit to climate change again and the thought that could possibly, because um, you talk about how it's a, this is the modern era pattern that really comes up that you, you look back starting with the Renaissance, starting the modern, right? And sometimes we talk about this as being postmodern. And as again, as I was saying earlier, we've come to the first time we're going through one of these seculum or secula, I mean, perhaps it's the <laughs> plural, but we're going, first time we're going through it where we really could go through this and tearing things apart actually just destroys it so much you can't put it back together again, which is the, da which is the danger. Um, could, and then, talk a little bit, which I brought up earlier, a little bit about climate change. I mean, we are, we start to read, it is getting so much that climate change is kind of an outside force. It's not an invader or a country, but it's a force that's out there that really um, could cause us a whole lot of damage if we don't get our, you know, figure it out. And it feels like we, we go to war and fight ourselves like this. Meanwhile, we're going to drown with the, you know, drown and burn, right? Right. So hey, look. Play with that a little bit. What do you think? Well, I, I think I think that all these issues that involve uh, uh, paradoxes of the global commons, right? In other words, um, you know, any nation can pollute the air, but it only suffers a tiny fraction of the of the of the of the of the negative, you know, cost right. of that. Right? This creates a problem, right? When you're dealing with a global community, but the same thing with trade policy. Uh, during the during the 1920s and 30s, right? In other words, the fourth turning, the end of the fourth turning is an order creating period, right? It allows you to create order, not just internally within the nation, but even globally, right? As 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 the as the democracies did after World War II, right? They created this very orderly pattern of of, of trade, and you know we had Bretton Woods, we had a fixed uh, exchange rate. You know, and we had certain restrictions on um, on investment flows, and it was, you know, that order was lost later on in the '70s and even more in the '80s and '90s and so on. But we created a very orderly world, and I think you have to think the same thing of well, what what are the sources of disorder? What are these um, failures of the commons? Right. Well, one of them is obviously carbon emissions. One of them is uh, you know pollution emissions. Uh, another one, which I think of a lot and maybe a bit more urgent is WMD, you know, what do we do about nuclear proliferation? But interestingly, if we don't have a fourth turning, if we don't improve some system of a more ordered global world, right? That could be even worse, you see what I mean? 
Yeah, so we're almost getting to the point where we have to have it now and we might manage to get through it so we can fix right. things a bit. Is well, that yeah, in other words, the, the, the whole problem is everyone just says everything you're saying about a fourth turning sounds terrible because we risk, uh, you know, democrats and autocrats and uh, the loss of our of our sovereignty and 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 all of, and and obviously uh, the trauma of conflict. Uh, it, it sounds terrible, and I say, yeah, but the only thing worse is a continuation of current trends. Right, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the system gets even more ossified and dysfunctional. We even feel more alienated. We even have more deaths of despair and loneliness and lack of community in America. Do you see what I mean? Oh, no, I totally do. I'm just looking for a, a way to think that we can get through it. Again, I'm just kind of worried that we will not, it will go through something and not re, not re, be able to cover. That's so a, it that's makes sense. Spring, as I say, spring doesn't come, we get yeah. to eternal winter. So that, that, that's always a danger. And that's yeah. uh, that focuses the mind wonderfully, doesn't it? And that it means does. You, you, and you need to do it right. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and I say constantly, there's nothing about this process which guarantees good or bad outcomes. I know. And, and I think that's the problem. Uh, we've had largely good outcomes in our history, which is why we're here today, right? But that's not guaranteed in the future. And uh, and I, I think about that a lot. Uh, and people ask me questions. I, I talk about it in the book, you know, about are we talking mainly about an internal crisis, right? Are we talking about civil conflict? Are we talking about external conflict? What And, and what kind of order are we likely to see when that's over, right? All of these questions are, are are critical. Yeah, I see. David maybe has another question yeah. for us. We we have some questions piling up, so we want to get to some of them. So we ha we have um, a number of people that have a similar question. I know you've touched on US, a lot of U.S. Um, factors here, and a few times you've talked to about foreign uh, cultures. But let me read the the questions to make sure I capture the essence for all these. Uh, uh, people that have the question. So Lorna asks, does your theory apply to non-Western cultures? What's unique about Western culture that lends itself to your theory? Karen says, how generalizable are your turnings to other countries? And uh, finally, um, uh, uh, Jersey, I think it is, uh, is, the, is the fourth change you were discussing, only? does it only apply to the U.S.? Uh, different societies have had different cycles of change in the U.S. Is the U.S. fourth change so powerful that it will overwhelm the cycles of change in other countries like China, India, and European Union. So I think there's a lot to chew on if you want to uh, go for that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a great question. And I will say the whole question about global generations and global patterns of history is, is one that we didn't talk much. We only talked in passing in our original book, The Fourth Turning. I give that a much more extended discussion in this new book because I think it is relevant. And one thing that that seems to be true is that these this long term cycle of change is an attribute. Uh, uh, Libby, it's something you actually asked, and that is, it, it, this is an attribute of societies that believe in progress, right? And that that's why it really starts, you know, with the Renaissance and Reformation, and why the whole subject of generations becomes popular after that time, because we always think we're going to do better than our parents, you know, rather than fit in with our parents. And as the entire world becomes more modern in that sense, I think it's true that almost any gener uh, most countries around the world today, certainly all of the high income countries, and I would say pretty much all of the emerging market countries have societies that think in the same terms, right? Generations want to do better than their parents. This, the sense of wanting improvement, paradoxically, that's what leads to the cycle, right? Because <laughs> Your, your desire to improve things always means that you're kind of bending it back. You're always correcting for the excesses of your elders and actually creates the generational cycle. I would say that particularly since World War II and the Great Depression, which let's face it, were, were global events, global fourth turning events for uh, not just the entire Anglophone world, but all of Europe, including Russia, obviously, uh, you know, Southern, uh, Southern Asia, uh, and I was wondering, India had its independence, and, and many countries had their colonial independence right around then. And obviously, East Asia and Japan and China and all of that world, this was a crisis for all of these places, and often the birth of new, entirely new uh, civic entities, new states during that period. And interestingly, about you know 30 to 40 years later, we had a great awakening around the world, when in so many places around the world... You know, when you talk about the 1960s and 70s, 
it wasn't just in Berkeley or Columbia University. We're talking about, uh, we had it in Paris. We had it in Prague. We had it in Berlin. We had it in Rome. We had the Red Brigade, the Bader Meinhof gang. We had, you know, we had all of these youth movements around the world. We, we had it in, in China, the, the whole cultural revolution with, with the Red Guard generation throwing away two millennia of Confucian culture. We had this in uh, we had this in Tokyo. We had this in Santiago. We had this in Mexico City, often with great violence. Youth rising up against their establishmentarian parents who created these monolithic and very powerful civic institutions. I think it wasn't just the last fourth turning that showed this consonance around much of the world, but also the last awakening. And to some extent, the world is on a very similar generational schedule with some generate with some countries a little bit in front of us or advanced or behind us. But um, it's interesting how with, with, with you know, global intercourse and the sort of the ability of, uh, as, as we fit into each other, we sort of all become more or less on the same schedule, which may be good news or bad news, depending on how you want to look at it. I think we're all moving into a fourth turning at the same time. But if you want to ask me, why we just asked it earlier. Uh, I remember Libby when he asked, why is authoritarian and popular authoritarianism and populism rising in so much of the world today? It's because again, the generational trends are so similar around the world today, right? That's why we're seeing it. Um, and I think that tendency for, for generations to gradually assume the same cycle is, is is something that just has to do with, you, you could call it sympathetic resonance. You know, you, when you have a cycle and you, and you bring things closer and closer together, pretty soon they're all tick-tocking the same way. This is something we actually found out with clocks <laughs> about, about uh, uh, two centuries ago. Then when you bring a bunch of mechanical clocks closer to closer to these, they're called sympathetic resonance. They pretty soon all sort of tick in unison, right? And this, this is another interesting idea in, in complexity theory. Uh, again, uh, much of this has to do with, with, with looking at cycles in complex systems. But sympathetic resonance is one of the attributes they have. And I think, I think we do see a, a more of a global cycle than we've ever seen before, um, which again is why we see so many of these moods that seem parallel in so many areas of the world today. I mean, yeah. The answer is yes, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank, you. thank you for that clarification, very succinct, uh, succinct. Okay, and Mort wants to know, so I know you talked about how it's the lifespan that really drives the, the whole length of the, the four turnings. And so he wonders, so people had a shorter lifespan in the past and we're living longer now, uh, although that's, you know, short term, that's not true. But yeah. uh, so are the, uh, were the, was the whole four turnings, the uh, whole cycle shorter in the past and getting longer? Yeah, a little clarification on that. Actually, the, the length of the generation is really based on the length of a phase of life. And particularly be between being born uh, and then coming of age fully as an adult, right? Uh, and then being able to, you know, and then another phase of life, being able to achieve society's highest positions, like, you know, president or whatever that might be in your mid, mid, you know, one would be in your early 20s, the next would be in your mid 40s, and so on. And when are you considered an elder? And this is really based on huge amount of work on phases of life, which are universal in almost every culture. They acknowledge phases of life, often rites of passage between phases of life. So what generations really derive from is the intersection between history itself and the roles expected at each phase of life. I mean, imagine you have a big crisis, like say World War II or something like that, right? Well, if you're a child, you're expected to see quiet, stay quiet and stay out of the way, right? But if you're just a little bit older into young adulthood, well, suddenly a very different role. You know, you're expected to, I don't know, sign up and go meet the enemy, right? So these create generational dividing lines, right? The, the intersection between what's going on historically and where you are in terms of your expected social role associated with your phase of life. Um, I think actually, although life expectancy 
was much shorter, obviously in the early modern era than it has been over the last century. Um, phases of life actually used to be longer. <laughs> it used to take longer for people actually to come fully of age um, uh, in early modern Europe. Uh, you know, you had to be in your late twenties really. Uh, this is one of the reasons why demographic growth was so low to be able to get married and set up a new household and so on. Generations were actually somewhat longer back then. They became shorter in the 19th century and the early 20th century. And we think now they're actually getting slightly longer again. Uh, again, partly due to what this person raised, but not only just uh, longevity, but the fact it's taking so much longer for people to becoming an adult. Uh, I have been point that out. I mean, my God, we've seen meteoric rises in the age of uh, first marriage, in the age of uh, childbirth, uh, in the age of a full-time career. I mean, all of these things have become much later than before. Uh, back, back in the early 1960s, these things were at record low ages. Now they're at record high ages. And, and the fact that, that generations we think are now becoming actually slightly longer is actually beginning to extend the sacrum a little bit. Whereas I think Back in, the eight, back in the 1800s and early 1900s, it actually shortened a little bit. And similarly, if you look at the average age of presidencies, they actually declined in American history, you know, from the first, you know, Virginia presidencies of, of you know, John Adams and, 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 and Thomas Jefferson and, and James Madison and so on. And you look forward, they actually got so much earlier, younger, uh, and uh, needless to say, they're becoming older today. I think... I think we can all agree on that. Uh, I think, uh, and you know, at the end of 2020, we had, uh, let's see, octogenarians, I believe, as uh, as minority leader, speaker of the house, and uh, president, all at the same time. I think you can say that was utterly without precedent in American history. So, the short answer is yes. Generations were becoming shorter for a time. I think now they're again becoming longer. And that, that actually has implications for the timing, the exact timing of the seculum, as I explained in the book. Okay, we, we have a couple of questions talking about specific circumstances that exist today. And so one of them uh, is a question about, you know, with the proliferation of guns, what effect is that going to have? And then another one, maybe I'll just throw in there at this point. Uh, Betty asked, I never before have uh, autocratic governments been able to almost totally control information received by the population, how does that fit in with your, with your thesis? Well, you know, look, um, I don't know. I'll take I guess I'll take them in order. Um, you know, look, there, there are a lot of things you can point to that's dangerous today. I think uh, prolifer pro proliferation of guns is one of them. Uh, and I would, but I think much more indicative of the mood is the fact that it's not just proliferation of guns, is the justification for having guns. I mean, if I went back 20 or 30 years ago, the justification was I want them as for hunting or something. And now it's, this is freedom. Without this gun, I can't prevent tyranny from someone in Washington. I mean, that is, that is like the, 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 the number one guarantee of freedom in this country is, is freedom from a tyrannical government. I can't recall a time in American history when the Second Amendment was kind of defended so vociferously from that point of view, but it's a sign of how serious this fourth turning now is, particularly from, you know, internal tribal, you know, differences, right? Red zone versus blue zone on that one. Uh, look, we are, um, uh, anyone seen the recent work of Barbara Walter talking about the likelihood of civil war in America, who's seen civil wars all over the world. And she says that, uh, um, the one, the one comment she made about America was that uh, she's, she's, she's talked to people in, uh, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. She's talked to people in, in South Asia, particularly Burma and so on. She says, wherever she talked to after a civil war, she said, everyone she talks to, they all say, we never saw it coming. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's always the same thing. Henry James, went, by the way, once said that in late in his life when he talked about the advent of the, of the Civil War. And he was actually in Washington, D.C. at the time. He says no one foresaw it coming at the time. He, he went on for quite some time. He was a very well-informed young man actually living in Washington. He knew everything was happening politically. He said no one actually believed it would, it would actually happen. Um, so I, I, I don't say that to alarm people. I simply say that, you know, I'm a demographer. I, I look at polls. 
And all I can tell you is 10 years ago, we never even asked a question about the possibility of civil war in America. That was off our wildest radar screen. Today, when we ask the question, roughly half of Americans say, think it's likely. Um, that's how much things have changed recently. Um, your next question was about, and repeat it so I remember. I think I, think I remember what it was about. Um, um, yeah, I mean, propaganda. Yeah, yeah, controlling, <laughs> yeah, right, the, controlling the, information. Yeah, probably. propaganda. Thank you. Thank you. you know, I, again, again, I, I discount the independent um, strength of technological changes. Yes, it is true that we have huge powers of surveillance. On the other hand, we have huge powers of communication uh, that we didn't have back then. Remember in the old days, for, first of all, throughout history, almost every governing, almost the government of any society, I don't care whether they're a kingdom or republic or whatever they were, um, political authorities always felt that communication was properly supervised by government. I mean, that was just always, that's why we have a U.S. post office, and that's why we, people monitor the mails, and that, that's, but, but this has always been true, that this has always been thought to be a necessary domain of, of, uh, of public authority, and remember that back then, it's true that they couldn't surveil you in the same way, but it's also true that people couldn't communicate very well on their own either. I mean, if you weren't able to have a postal service or, I mean, how would you communicate with someone in another village unless you, I don't know, hiked or took a horse or something, right? In other words, we have very sophisticated means of communication, right, electronically and otherwise. We also have very sophisticated movement uh, uh, means of surveillance. I just regarded it a, as a constant war of one against the other, right, of the individual wanting to communicate and governments wanting to surveil uh, and and the outcome of that is, is is always a little bit uncertain. Yeah, I think that kind of leads us into a couple other questions that really relate to control. So Effie asks, what effect do you think will happen during the next turning as many states pass laws that impact individuals in negative ways? And a very related question, uh, Frederick uh, asks, in your framework, what is happening today when a segment of American society wishes to impose its own values on education, healthcare, gender, race, climate, uh, conservation, voting, et cetera. Is this uh, imposition a necessary consequence of the framework at this stage? Um, you know, how does that end? How does that end? Is that the question? Where does well, that lead? I think, I think, uh, I think the, 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 the first question, question is more like what's going to happen uh, as we go forward in the fourth turning. And I think the second question is, you know, are, now that we're in the fourth turning, are these things happening as a consequence of your theory? I think that's how I interpret them. Yeah. And I, then if we can yeah, wrap, wrap up with what could we do? <laughs> I'd like some advice. Yeah, I, 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 think it's both a, I think it's both the cause and the consequence. That is to say, when people feel in, increasingly threatened, they want to join a larger community. Everyone's searching for community, right? Everyone feels alone. Everyone feels isolated, particularly the younger generation. So we want to join a community. And the real question is, is it going to be two completely separate communities with, with uh, you know, diametrically opposed visions of the future? And if you want to know how that ends, uh, the end, it, it ends with one side winning. I mean, I hate to say it, but that's kind of how it ends. Or the two sides, that their difference is being rendered irrelevant by something they both need to do together. You know, is that fair enough? <laughs> I think we realize kind of where that leads. Um, and interestingly enough, that's that's one thing I actually spent some time discussing, which was how America, which had so so totally cleaved into these two ideological camps uh, by 1940, how it possibly rallied into one camp uh, with uh, you know into becoming the arsenal for democracy and finally going to war and making those critical investments in time to be durable, right? To be able to last and to be able to prevail in the period of crisis that was about to happen. Yeah, and, and here's one that I can, I think you can uh, bring some of this full circle. It says, I can't remember which philosopher posited cycles of, of, of thesis, antithesis, and finally synthesis with synthesis representing improvement. Uh, do you see any synthesis in, in your cycles, which I guess would be the, the, the high, right? Uh, turning. Yeah, I think you're referring to uh, G.B.F. Hegel. Uh, he was a famous one for that. And uh, 
you can interpret it that way, absolutely. In other words, that uh, these the cycles are not necessarily endless uh, going nowhere, but but could be a cycle of improvement. And I think that's certainly one way to, to, to uh, make compatible an idea of ultimate progress, right? With the idea that we cycle to and through different needs that we have as a community at different times. Um, I think uh, other social philosophers have, I think, have been much more in tune with the whole idea of a generational cycle. And one that I point out, by the way, which is uh, uh, Ibn, Ibn Khaldun, who's uh, the Islamic philosopher who wrote in the 15th century, you know, uh, the Mukaddima. Uh, it's a wonderful work, uh, absolutely pathbreaking, and uh, actually did actually put forward a not only a, a four generation turning, but actually talked about generational succession and being at the root of, uh, of the rise of feelings of community and its uh, and its uh, and its dissolution over a period of four generations. So, if you were a local elected official, what would you want to be doing to try to help your community get through the next decade? Or you could do it for individuals too here, because everybody's an individual trying to figure out right now. What do I do? Well, the most important thing for individuals is to uh, same thing with communities. That's the same lesson, and that is to realize that uh, your national community is probably going to have is going to be really busy uh, with with agendas that are much more important necessarily than your your own creature comforts or your own you know your 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 own amenities, right? Your own peace of mind, and so it's very important that people learn to become you know, to have communities, to build communities. Um, uh, people often, you know, I'm, 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 an, I'm a financial advisor, so to speak, and people often ask me about uh, long-term care insurance. And I'd say, the only affordable long-term care insurance is your family. And you better get to know them well, and you better get to <laughs> have a bunch of close friends, have a family. Uh, and, and I think millennials already know that, which is why they are so community oriented, why they're actually living so long with their families and, and actually pretty good at developing long term relationships with older family members. I think for communities, a lot of it has to do with becoming simply more disaster resistant, right? Figuring out what kinds of things you may need and not be able to get when times are down, right? These may be very material needs. Uh, these may be. Um, I often think about, uh, you know, do you have water? Do you have food? What about generators? I mean, I constantly thought about- Solar power is what I keep thinking. Yeah. Maybe well, we need more of these solar rays, right? I think, I think a BMP blast. And uh, are you able to actually replace generators, you know, for, for electrical grids? Uh, generators actually are very difficult to build. They take years of time. We have this, the supply chain problems we're likely to have with that. Uh, in other words, particular um, bottlenecks that we just may not be able to get that part ever, right? Do you have those? Have you identified what those are? And I will say that one thing we see that I, we're all familiar with at a national level is how often very particular investments we made at one time, often controversial investments made before the climax of the crisis, right? Before the climax of the fourth turning, made all the difference, right? When the fourth turning happened. And uh, one I sometimes talk about is the, uh, is the two Navy Act that was passed just after the fall of France in the United States. And this laid out the, uh, this laid out, you know, the Iowa class battleships and the Essex class destroyers and basically all the capital ships that finally came online in the Pacific War in 1943. And if we had not started the investment, in 1940, with this massive, this is by far the biggest appropriations ever for a new Navy. If we had not done that then, where would we have been? We, we were down to like one aircraft carrier at the time of Guadalcanal, right? Suddenly we had them all coming online. Uh, something very, very similar. Uh, and I know that we were talking about the soft line earlier, but uh, the Athenians, uh, after the first battle of Marathon, they were thinking, well, but let's see, uh, the Persians are going to come back, right? And the Themistocles at that time, he was head of Athens. And then most of the Athenians said, no, nah, no, nah, they're gone forever. I mean, <laughs> and and the, Athenians, the Athenians discovered a new silver mine. So they had suddenly access to all these new revenues. And most of them says, well, let's just, you know, cut taxes, you know. Have a big party. 
Yeah. Right, that early party. And then Mr. Clay said, said, no, the Persians are going to be back. Let's build a big fleet. And there was a lot of grumbling, but they did build a big fleet. Now, obviously, if they didn't have the fleet, we wouldn't have had the Battle of Salamis. The, the Greeks might not have, you know, you know what I mean. The history would have turned out very differently. These are the things that fascinate me. How often foresightedness at a moment when it's not yet obvious, right, makes all the difference when the moment happens. And these, you asked earlier, what, what's the difference between a fourth turning that ends well and doesn't end well? And very often it's foresight, right? It's the ability to do things now when the public doesn't yet necessarily agree with you. You may just barely get it passed, right? Uh, you may just barely get it in, but it could make it could make those differences. Yeah, so that's that's a little bit of personal advice, maybe some advice for uh, you know for for local government. Um, but I think you do want to imagine how you're going to function and have you you know do you have a scale of priorities? In other words, do you are you able to triage like what would happen? in a disaster, you have just basically disaster plans, right? I mean, how, how do you manage, how will you manage to cope with some of these things? And just a little bit of planning in advance can make a huge amount of difference uh, should it happen. So what we probably need to do, one of the passages I outlined was you were talking about, I forget where it was, all of these catastrophes that could happen at once. And how are you going to respond? Because I think we do. We have plans. We do. We're ready for a lot, also multiple things. But I'm not sure we're ready for the cyber attack on top of the weapons attack on top of the. Well, this is there. Yeah, there's an analogy, Libby, in financial markets, right? And this is the this is the byword in financial markets. They say, you know, the the trick with financial markets is is diversification. You know, diversify all your assets. The problem is. In a huge downturn, they all go down. The correlation of the assets is one. You know, they, they all go in the same direction. It's the same problem, right? If there's a big crash, everything goes down, right? Mm-hmm. And, and it might and not so be a bad you, idea to make some victory gardens, right? There that. you go. There you go. Victory gardens. Uh, yeah, we can we can actually draw some lessons, you know, from 1943 and 1944. Um, uh, and that kind of self-sufficiency, but more important than victory gardens is just being friends with neighbors who have victory yeah. gardens, <laughs> which is just as good. But that that sense, by the way, of um, and and it does worry me today. It, it worries me. Uh, it worries me. Even people who talk a lot about community, uh, who are very positive about community in theory, aren't very community oriented in, in and of themselves. I, I'm often reminded, reminded of the, the classic social science study, which came out about uh, six or seven years ago, showing that the likelihood of people knowing who their next door neighbor is, is actually directly and inversely related to the population density wherever they live. <laughs> so if you live in an, an urban apartment in New York, you don't know how any of your neighbors are, even though they live right next to you, right? But if you live in a rural area and your neighbor is half a mile down the road, you absolutely know who that person is. And it is an irony, isn't it? That uh, <laughs> that having a lot of people next to you often makes us oblivious because we're not really dependent on them in the same way, right? We're dependent yeah. upon larger entities of social organization like governments and so on to serve all of our own personal needs. Whereas we live off in a more rural area, right? Where those don't exist. Right, yeah, Correct. depend on each other. Yeah, exactly. although we had a warm up, Neil. With the pandemic. We did. And there yeah, was a lot of, I mean, I was impressed about how our community pulled together, knocking on neighbors' doors, checking on people, getting food. I mean, it was it was pretty, it wasn't perfect, but people really did step up to help each other. And I think that may serve to help us as we go into whatever. One of the problems, of course, with the pandemic is one of those odd events that actually pulled people away at the same time but pulled them together, right? Because the nature of an epidemic, you know, you, you don't want to get too close right. to anyone. Right? And, and I think that 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 was that was made it such a fraught moment. But 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 emergencies emergencies always do that. Yeah, they're good warm-ups. David. You know, we, we have one uh, last question and I and it's from Alan. I apologize, Alan, he was first in, but I thought oh. it, I thought it might be better after you covered your topic. So here's the question. 
So how did you and Bill meet and begin writing on this topic of generation? And what did you miss from Bill in writing the current book on your um, own? Yeah. Wow. Well, that's a, that's an interesting question. We, we actually met. Um, uh, I was, uh, I, I wrote a book in the uh, late 1980s with Pete Peterson, actually. He was a, uh, uh, chairman of Lehman Brothers, he uh, he eventually founded Blackstone Group. I think a lot of people are familiar with that. Uh, and uh, we we co-authored a book together called On Borrowed Time. It was really on on the actually it was it was a generational topic. It made me interested in generations. I wanted to know what caused our budget to become you know to move from in, mainly investing in the future and families and so on to be mu much more focused on you know providing security to old age which was you know one of the big trends that we saw in the 70s and 80s something that joe califano and secretary of hew back then everyone was calling attention to and of course it's just grown even more ever since right in that direction and 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 I, so that actually led me into a generational topic, uh, uh, a generational thinking about what is it about some generations that they invest in the future and, 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 and uh, kind of reward themselves and others really don't. They, they, they invest in, you know, they invest in their kids. They don't invest in themselves. They don't give benefits themselves. And uh, Bill, Bill, meanwhile, wrote another book back then with another co-author on um, on the Vietnam War and what happened to draft dogs in the Vietnam War? Where did they go and what did they do and how many ended up in Canada? How many you know how many how many did all of the different individual responses? Um, so the two of us met because I think we were both involved in a common project uh, with Peterson, some odd project. But it, ultimately, I moved down to DC in the mid 1980s and we started talking with each other having been introduced uh, through through this common uh, person that we knew and we were very interested in we weren't interested in cycle of history at all we were interested in generational differences uh, bill and i were both members of the boomer generation and one thing that absolutely fascinated us is why we were so different than um, than our parents' generation. Now, you know, the, the same age our parents' generation was building battleships and splashing ashore at D-Day and founding families. I mean, boomers were boomers were at Woodstock. They were taking voyages to the interior. They had a completely different sense of themselves and their role in history. And we wanted to know, had that ever happened before in history? And what is it that shapes different generations' agendas? Uh, Ortega y Gasset, who's, who's one of the very famous generation theorists, uh, 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 you know, Spanish intellectual coming out of the experience of the Spanish losing their empire. He, he himself had a real reason to think generationally himself. And, and he once said that a generation is not an entity. It's not a stable thing. It's a trajectory through time. It, it's an entity with hopes and fears. And he said, one thing that makes generations very unlike any other kind of social category, they're not like, you know, women or rich people or Californians or something like that, is they said that those things are just eternal. Those are just abstractions. He said, a generation is actual people. They're born, they live, they die. <laughs> they're finite, right? You can't say that about the, the upper, you know, the, the fourth quintile of the American population by income. You know, you know what I mean? And, and, and that lends generations a very different aspect. They have hopes. They, they are one thing, but they yearn to become something else over time, right? And it goes back to that idea of the generational diagonal. It's not just that we're different because of our memories, but we look forward to a different future and we look forward to a different society collectively as we grow older. Uh, generations have agendas. Uh, generations have ways in which they wish the, the, their community, their, their, their wider community can become different from what they remember its problems being when they were younger. And that, that fascinated us. Um, generations were a huge topic when, when boomers are coming of age. I think anyone who was there, the late 60s and early 70s, there was a generation gap, a generation war. Everyone talked about this generational divide. And then by the late 70s with disco and then with the 80s, it completely disappeared. 
And when when Bill and I wrote our book, uh, Generations, um, uh, it was it was eye opening for a lot of people, particularly younger people who had never really heard much, you know, about about generations. Particularly Xers, who were young people at the time, became very interested in it. Uh, your last question about what's the exp I think your experience is what's it like writing? I, it, it, well, no, what what do you what did you, what did you in writing this last book? Uh, what did you miss by not having Bill there writing with you? you no. Know, uh, yeah, I, I missed a lot. Uh, and I will say this. Um, collaboration, a successful collaboration involves complementary talents, right? Uh, maybe a good marriage is the same way. I, I don't know, Libby. I haven't, I, I, my, I don't dare say anything on this subject, but it's very important <laughs> that people have different strengths that they bring to the table. If, if you have the same strengths as someone else, you both want to do the same thing, and the thing that really has to be done that neither one of you wants to do will never get done. <laughs> so yeah. the project will just never move forward. And I think what was great about Bill and I is that uh, we had complementary strengths. He was um, a very prolific and eloquent writer, but he could he could race off a first draft at amazing speed. Um, and I was more. Uh, I was more uh, architectonic. I like to think about the logic of the argument and I like to put the pieces together. So we we kind of went and we rewrote each other's drafts that way, but it was it was very effective. Uh, I don't think either one of us alone would have been able to do the work. Uh, and I, I I missed that greatly. You know, last as I wrote this new book, I, I sort of thought about how we work together and maybe it's sometimes what what he would have done you know, to yeah. sort of fill in that gap. Yeah, good partnership, I think, is a good, a good marriage. One and one makes three because you each exactly. leverage the other. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Bill was a great guy. I mean, you could just tell. I'm sure you missed him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I want to thank uh, you, Neil and Libby, for joining us. This has been a fascinating conversation. I want to thank the audience for sticking with us. I know it's been a long program. And if you don't have anyone that has to drop off, I just let you know we are recording this. We will put it on YouTube. You can go to encorelearning.net, go to the events page, scroll down, and you'll get to our YouTube page. Uh, I think we're seeing some, you know, positive reactions here on the Zoom screen. Um, and um, thank you for your great questions. So uh, at this point, I mean, we pretty much finished our program, but I'll kick it back over to, to Neil and Libby. Do you have any any parting thoughts to kind of pull everything together? No, I just hope everybody enjoyed it as much as I did. I hope you enjoyed the conversation, Neil. I know you do this a lot. Really appreciate you coming and joining us and lots of food for thought. And um, now I got through Victoria, I may send you some questions over time because I got to figure out <laughs> how to try to help our community kind of face what's coming up. So thank you so very much for your work and thanks for being here today. You're welcome. It was really a pleasure to be here and share all this with you. Okay, thanks everyone. Don't forget, uh, you can uh, uh, fill out a survey once we close out here. Okay, thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Everybody stay well. At the core of modern history lies this remarkable pattern. Over the past five or six centuries, Anglo-American society has entered a new era, a new turning, every two decades or so. The first turning is a high, an upbeat era of strengthening institutions and weakening individualism. The second turning is an awakening, a passionate era of spiritual upheaval. The third turning is an unraveling, a downcast era of strengthening individualism and weakening institutions. The fourth turning is a crisis, a decisive era of secular upheaval. America entered its most recent fourth turning in 2008, placing us 15 years into the crisis era. What can we expect during the remainder of this era? And what will follow it? 
Like nature's winter, a fourth turning can be long and arduous. It can be brief but stormy. The icy gales can be unremitting. But also like nature's winter, it cannot be averted. It must come, just as this winter has. <laughs>